think most of us have. I know we, uh, we sung it here a couple of years ago, uh, not in this particular, I don't think we've ever sung it in this building, but we used to sing it all the time uh, in the other building, and so we, we, we praise the Lord that we can kind of pull up some of these familiar songs and then, of course, uh, sing them, uh, you know, for Sunday school. <clears throat> well, today... Uh, we're going we're gonna to be looking at a subject that not too many people think about um, unless you encounter someone that might believe this way. Um, and, and, and this particular study, this has to do with the subject of, of Calvinism. Calvinism. Um, <clears throat> we, we obviously, uh, uh, you may not know it, but some of, some of our Baptist preachers, Baptist churches uh, have embraced Calvinism over the years, and and some of our heroes um, had some various uh, teachings uh, that they promoted in their church uh, concerning Calvinism. If you don't know what that is, we're going to talk about that. We're gonna we're gonna talk about uh, some other things that, of course, uh, some of the various tenets of Calvinism. Uh, obviously, you younger. Guys, uh, for you, this might not be that exciting to you, uh, uh, but as you get older, if you walk with the Lord, you're going to encounter Calvinists, and, and they may be from different denominations. They may be from this, from Baptist denominations, and so you need to be prepared on how to deal with them. Well, I, I want you to turn. We're going to go to two passages by way of introduction. First of all, we're going to go to Romans chapter number 8. <clears throat> Romans chapter 8 is one of those uh, uh, key references that Calvinists often refer to as probably one of the foundational texts uh, involving uh, their belief in this thing of Calvinism. And and we often quote one of the passages, they leave this one out, uh, but, but the two following verses is, is what they latch on to. Romans chapter 8, and we're going to read verse number 28 through verse number 30. Verse 28 through verse 30. Uh, 28 is a familiar text to many of us. In fact, some of us may have it applied to our memory. Uh, the Bible says, and we know all things work together for good to them that love God to them who are the call <clears throat> according to his purpose, according to his purpose. In verse number 29, this is where Calvinists really start to get into uh, their belief. It says, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestine to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, he, them he also glorified. Glorified. Uh, just a, a, a footnote here, that word glorified, that is, that's in the future tense, okay? In other words, that's going to happen in the future, all right? No one that would identify as a Christian is glorified now, all right? That's going to take place when we get on the other side and God has everything lined up for when uh, we will partake in that and, be, and, and then experience this, this glorification that's mentioned there. So, so I want you to know that's, that's in the future tense. That's not in the present tense. That's not right now, okay? Uh, if, if it was right now, uh, then we would not, uh, Christi Christianity would not suffer what it has suffered over the years if we were glorified, okay? Um, and so, but that's in the future tense. That's in heaven. That's not on this side. All right, now I want you to go to Matthew chapter number 23. Matthew 23. <clears throat> uh, now, this is uh, uh, one of the biggest problems uh, that Calvinists face uh, when they try to convince 
those who are not Calvinists, that is you and I, um, they have a big problem with, with this reference here in, in Matthew chapter number 28. And look at verse number 37 through verse, uh, Matthew 23, Matthew 23, I'm sorry, Matthew 23, verse number 37 through 38. Jesus is, is speaking here and, and he is just crushed uh, as he viewed the Jewish people uh, being led with like they were without a shepherd. And in verse number 37, it says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, stoneth them which are sent unto thee, how oft, often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth uh, her, her chicks, chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Then he says, Behold, your house is left desolate, and your, behold, your house is left unto you desolate, for I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Now again, that's Matthew 23, verse 37 to verse number 39. Uh, so let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray, Father. We thank you, God, for your word. I thank you for the privilege of opening the Bible and, and doing um, my part uh, to help uh, reveal to these men, these young men, uh, what it means to, uh, to better defend the faith concerning the teaching of Calvinism. Uh, Lord, this is something that, uh, this teaching is something that has made uh, many inroads into the Baptist church, and there are Baptist preachers that promote this, that teach this. And uh, God, we're going to see probably one of the biggest reasons why they teach and why they promote it. Uh, but thank you, God, that we have your word. Thank you, Lord, that uh, we can compare uh, scripture with scripture. God, we can debate, become better uh, equipped to debate those that would try to convince us that we are all, uh, that we are all predestined. Some are predestined to go to heaven. Some are predestined to go to hell. We thank you for your word and the clarity with that. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, there are uh, many of uh, what's called Reformed churches, Reformed churches uh, that have given, uh, that have been birthed. They came into existence based on what's called Reformed theology, Reformed theology. I, I thought it was interesting years ago, and this, is, this study is going to be a two-parter. It may even be a three-parter. So, so having said that, uh, we're going to have quite a bit of, of, of comments. If you want to add to this, this study uh, questions, please, by all means, do so. Uh, we're, we want to open, open things up uh, because people have questions when we talk about certain subjects. And we want to give you the opportunity. That goes for you guys as well. Don't think uh, that we're, we're excluding you. We're excluding you too because I know you have questions, uh, maybe not about this subject, but about other subjects. And we're going to give you opportunity to express that moving forward. But when I was in, I was in Belleville, Illinois, before we even started this church, I pastored the church there, started the church in Belleville, Illinois. And I thought it was amazing. I was one day, my wife and I were traveling down Main Street and, and I saw Reformed Mormon Church. And I said, <clears throat> Reformed Mormon Church. And, and right away, I thought of Reformed theology, right? And, and, and honestly, I, I don't know, I, I was very tempted during the week to go and knock on the door and see if the pastor was there and find out what exactly do you people believe? Do you believe? Uh, uh, but I never, I never had opportunity to do that uh, in the two and a half years that we were there. Uh, but, uh, but, but there are various churches that have like Reformed uh, theology or, or Reformed uh, Baptist, Reformed uh, Lutheran church. Uh, they have that word reform. And, and a lot of that, if you see that on the sign, there's a Reformed church, Reformed Christian church on uh, 75th on the south side of Kenosha, 75th. And around, I don't know, maybe 33rd, 35th, something like that. Uh, but, uh, oh, by the way, that church, uh, that Reformed Mormon church, no longer exists. Uh, it doesn't exist anymore. And I wonder why. 
uh, but uh, uh, so, uh, but but Reformed theology. Some churches were birthed following this particular teaching. Uh, where does this teaching stem from? This stems from a man, uh, a good man, a man that loved God. Uh, his name was John Calvin. John Calvin, and another one of his, uh, uh, I guess, contemporaries would be John Knox. Okay, you probably heard of these men. These men were considered to be reformers, reformers, okay? Uh, <clears throat> uh, they came out uh, now, uh, and, and then they, you know, they reformers, uh, they came out of the Catholic Church, okay, the Catholic Church. That's why they're called reform Martin Luther, okay? He, he was uh, uh, John Wycliffe. These were reformers. These were the people that saw that there were problems in the Catholic Church. And they came out of the Catholic Church. And when they came out, they decided to, to birth churches, okay, uh, based on, on certain uh, theology, certain teaching. And, and, and so uh, uh, that's where, where a lot of this, this Reformed theology come from. Obviously, we're going to talk about some of that here shortly. Many Reformers or many Reformed churches today, uh, here's, here's, okay, there's, Presbyterians. How many of you heard of Presbyterian denomination? Presbyterian. Okay. Presbyterians, they are uh, Reformed churches. They, they embrace the teaching of John Calvin. Okay. Um, uh, the Evangelical Anglican Church. You probably never heard of that. How many of you have heard of congregational churches? Congregational churches. Okay. Uh, reform theology churches, okay, reform theology churches. Now, uh, by the way, some of these churches no longer exist, okay? They have died out. And, and one of the biggest reasons why, that we're going to see one of the biggest reasons why uh, they died out. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but, but uh, Congregationalists, Presbyterians, I know in Waukegan, on Grand Avenue, there is still a Presbyterian church there. That church was there when we first moved years ago, moved to the area and lived in Zion during that time frame. That church is still there. But now we have Reformed Baptist churches, okay, Reformed Baptist churches. Now, I'm going to mention some names. Uh, these are some of our heroes. Uh, we, we still to this day listen to some of their sermons. Uh, we still to this day uh, consider them to be good guys, and they are, but they were, they were off on, on Reformed theology, okay, Calvinistic teachings, okay? Now, now, does that mean that we shouldn't listen to what they have to say because they're off in this area? No, no. And, and I think that one of the things that we do um, as independent Baptists you know, we, we write a person off because they're off in this one area, okay? And, and I don't, I, I, the, the older I get, the more I understand that I shouldn't do that because there's still some positive things that they've taught. Now, you, by the way, uh, uh, you know, don't, don't walk out of here saying, preacher said that there are some good things that Jehovah Witnesses teach. Or there are some good things that Mormon teach, or there's there's some good things that Catholic teach, or there's some good things that Lutheran teaches. You didn't hear me say that, okay? And you won't hear me say that. But but there are some other denominations that that teach they 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 teach or they have taught some things that we believe in as Baptists, and we shouldn't automatically write them off because they. Um, you know, they're off on the teaching of, of Calvinism or predestination, all right? Let me give you some names. Famous Calvinist, R.C. Sproul. How many of you ever heard of him? R.C. Sproul, okay? I used to listen to him. He's in heaven now. I believe he's in heaven. And by the way, I believe he knows now that, that what, he, what he taught on Calvinism was wrong, amen? Uh, uh, but R.C. Sproul. R.C. Sproul Jr., his son. Okay, he comes on 88.1. Uh, the family station, he, he teaches. He, you know, put it, moved himself in the steps of his dad, and now 
He's, he's teaching. I think he pastors that church where R.C. Sproul pastor. Mark Driscoll. You probably never heard of him. He, uh, Mark Driscoll. Uh, the Driscolls. I'm trying to remember his father pastored a large. Now, now this is uh, like an Assemblies of God church in, in Milwaukee. Oh, man, I can't remember his name. His dad was from like England. And, and just a dynamic preacher, don't believe the way we believe, believe some of the things we believe, but you won't, you'll never hear me embracing or endorsing, you know, Assemblies of God churches, all right? But, but built a big church, a big work in, 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 in uh, uh, Milwaukee, in that area there. Uh, John Piper, how many of you ever heard of him? John Piper, okay. Now, John Piper has been uh, given over to ecumenicalism. Okay, uh, and that's another subject in itself. Tim Keller, Albert Moeller. How many of you ever heard of him? Albert Moeller, Southern Baptist, Southern Baptist pra a preacher. He too has bought into, if you've heard uh, Brandon House, Brandon House has nailed Albert Moeller on, on a lot of his, his, uh, his uh, theology now. He's embraced a lot of this uh, globalism and things like that. John MacArthur, John MacArthur. Not everybody in here has heard of John oh, yeah. MacArthur. Okay. All right, Brother Grace, I need you to raise your hand sooner or later. Amen. Uh, uh, John MacArthur, I listened to him today. He, you know, he's, uh, you know, Grace to You comes on WBCY. Uh, I think at what time? I think around 10 something, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, uh, or earlier, yeah, eight, oh, 830. Right, right, from 830 to 9, okay. Years ago, he used to come on at 10 something. But, but yeah, I listened to him today. You know, tremendous preacher. Uh, you know, uh, took a stand concerning COVID, kept his church open. Yeah, Amen. Yeah. Made national news. Uh, has one of the largest churches in, in, in America. But he also, he is a Calvinist. He's a Calvinist. Okay. Uh, uh, does that mean that I'm going to tune him out? No. Uh, but, you know, there are some things I can, I can still learn from him just because he's okay. Jonathan Edwards. You know, that great fiery preacher, sinners in the hands of an angry God. You know, the, the greatest preacher, oh, the, I'm sorry, the greatest sermon he ever preached was that sermon. And he did not raise his voice one time preaching that sermon. Uh, they said that he actually read the sermon like this. And, and, and revival broke out because of that sermon, uh, sinners in the hands of an angry God. James D. Kennedy. James D. Kennedy, amen, one of my heroes, amen, one of my heroes, Presbyterian Church, okay, Calvinistic teaching, Calvinistic theology, um, uh, one of the things I thought was interesting was that, he, you know, he was Calvinist, but you look at some of the old, uh, you can still go online and look at some of his sermons, uh, and you, you get some of his pamphlets, some of his material, listen to him online, man, you think that he's like us, amen, because he still preached sermon on the need to win people to Christ. Yes, Brother Gracian. <clears throat> yes. Well, I think I think he was more or less like an exception to the rule. Uh, because, you know, diehard Calvinists don't knock doors. Um, you know, uh, there are now, now there are Cal Right. And we're going and we're going to talk about that. Uh, but there are. Yeah, there are some who are five point Calvinists. Okay, and we're going to talk about that. I don't believe I don't believe James Kennedy was a five point Calvinist. I, I believe that he believed in some of that. Okay, but not all of it. Because if he did, why would he knock doors? Why would he feel the need to go out and win souls? But, uh, but James D. Kennedy, wow, Coral Ridge Ministries, man, you talk about a, just a phenomenal ministry. You know, but it's sad what ended up happening after he went home to be with the Lord. Billy Graham, Billy Graham. How many of you heard of Billy Graham? I mean, he's a national name, known name. His grandson took over that ministry and killed it, killed that ministry. Uh, and and uh, uh, I mean, just, I mean, truths, of course, Coral Ridge, I don't even know if they even exist today. I don't think the church exists today. I think it's called something else. And, 
but but yeah yeah um, uh, you know just 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 the tragedy what happened uh, and and again that's why it's so important for a church whenever it's time to vote in a new pastor you make sure you vet the next person that's going to come in you need right. to do that because all it's I often tell people uh, that a church is only one one pastor away from closing its doors and in other churches sometimes they're only one sermon away from closing their doors yeah because some some men man they preached a sermon that really did something and next thing you know everybody left the church <laughs> so you got to be careful you gotta you got that's why the bible is so important uh uh james boyce you probably never heard of him uh, i've heard of him years ago good man he's in heaven john Witherspoon, or, uh, John Witherspoon, do you know who he is? John Witherspoon is one of the founding fathers. And I believe he signed the Declaration of Independence, okay, or the Constitution of the United States. Uh, then here's a big name, a big name, Charles Spurgeon. Charles Hatton Spurgeon. Yes, Charles Spurgeon uh, was a Calvinist, okay? He was a Calvinist Baptist. But, but he was like James D. Kennedy, I don't believe he was a five-point Calvinist. Now, why do I say that? Uh, he put a book out called The Soul Winner. Uh, I have that book. Uh, and, and man, just a, a, he was a phenomenal soul winner. Just a phenomenal soul winner. So, so these are some of the people that preached Calvinistic theology or Reformed theology. Whether they were diehard Calvinists, uh, I don't believe most are, but I believe some of these guys I mentioned were diehard diehard Calvinist. I get a newsletter from a certain church in, in I don't know, I don't know if they're, I think they're in Mississippi, and, and each, each publication that I get, you, as I, I told my wife the other day, I was reading through some of the sermons, and you can see some Calvinism in each one of the sermons. So, you, you know, I, I said, man, I might have to let them know, stop sending me this material. Uh, but, okay, so we're talking about the subject, and, and this is the name of this this subject, this study, here it is. If God is sovereign, then isn't everything predestined to happen? Okay. If God is sovereign, now, now Calvinists, they, they say God is sovereign. Uh, sovereign Grace Baptist Church. If you ever see that name, Sovereign Grace Baptist Church, you'll find out that is a Calvinistic church. There are churches out there, they're called Sovereign Grace Baptist Church. Two names in that title, sovereign and grace, okay, which, which I think is, is sort of like an oxymoron. Grace says that, that, you know, God gives to us what we don't deserve, amen. Right. We don't deserve salvation. Uh, but sovereign, that means God is sovereign over everything. Well, he is sovereign over everything, but, but he gives us a free will to make the choice to receive him, which is one of the fallacies of, uh, of uh, uh, Calvinism. So um, uh, many there are for, for many uh, that have focused in on, on Calvinistic teaching, one of the big paramount statements in Calvinistic teaching is this subject called predestination. Predestination. Predestination is the notion that God has predestined some to go to heaven and some to go to hell some to go to heaven, and some to go to hell. Do you, I mean, let me ask you a question on the surface. Is your God like that? Where he will allow you to be born in this world and to grow up into a full-fledged adult and then predestine you to go to hell? I mean, to me, that, that, that cuts into the love of God that cuts into the grace of God. I mean, man, that just, that cuts it into the compassion of God, you know, the mercy of God. But, but some people believe that some are predestined to go to heaven and to go to hell. They further believe that, that uh, uh, in their belief uh, affirms, their belief affirms that God has absolutely willed to save certain men without having the least regard to righteousness, obedience, and is uh, uh, prejudice. Uh, uh, I have prejudice here, but but uh, 
prejudice to men because of them being predetermined uh, that they have uh, no say in what God uh, has already predetermined. Predestinationalists often use the word predestinate as an excuse to justify their lack of winning souls, their lack of winning souls in service for God. After all, if God has predestined some to be saved and some to be lost, then why should we even attend church? Why should we come to church? You know, and, 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 and again, what's the purpose of church? You know, why do you go to church? What, you know, why, do we, why, is, why are churches here? Well, churches primarily should be here to point you to Jesus Christ. That's why churches exist, okay? Now, I get it. We live in a society, I was talking to someone uh, yesterday when we were out soul winning, and he said, do you know that 1,100 churches across the country are closing a month? 1,100 churches a month are closing. And I said, I didn't know it was that many. I asked him, why is that? He said, because of COVID. He said, what has happened, a lot of the churches have embraced online services, and because of that, a lot of people have decided not to go back to church because they can right. see church on television. Uh. And, and, and I say, that's a weak Christianity. Yeah. That's a very weak Christianity because you know as well as I know right. that if I'm going to look at church on television before long, I'm going to turn the television set off. Yep. I'm going to turn church off. And I'm going to go on with my life just like the heathen and blend into society and then, and then sit around and complain why society is the way it is. And, and I thought that was, that was sad. But, but Calvinists, based on their theology, why, why should we come to church? If after all, you know, Brother Nick, God is predestined for you to go to heaven and, and gave God is predestined for you to go to hell. And Alex, God is predestined you to go to heaven. And Brother Horinda, God is definitely predestined you to go to hell. I mean, why? why? <laughs> I'm just joking. Okay, I'm just joking. <laughs> You're a Calvinist now? But, but I mean, why, why go to church? If, if that is, you know, you know, from that standpoint. Now, of course, in a, in a Calvinist church, you wouldn't even hear what I just said. You'd get a different take on it because you're in a Calvinist church. Uh, so, and, and that's, that's what that's, that's all about. Now, uh, it reminds us of this text. I want you to turn to Romans. Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. If, if it's true that, that God has, has predestined some to go to heaven and some to go to hell, then we get to use an excuse to justify not going to church. It's almost like this passage here in Romans chapter 9, verse number 20. The Bible says this, and this is speaking of, of the Jews. God's, the Bible, Paul says, nay, but O man, who art thou that uh, uh, re re reply is against, against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, why hast thou made me thus? You know, it, that's an excuse. That is an excuse. And, and it's, it's like Calvinists are giving an excuse to this thing of doing what should be done to get people to Christ by saying that God has predestined some to go to heaven and some to go to hell. I mean, it's like saying that, you know, well, God, you made me like this. So God, based on what I believe according to your word, I am already predestined, so I am excused from introducing people to Christ. I am also excused from going to church and even reading my Bible because after all, God, you know, there are some things, you know, you, you, if you predestine it, there's just, it doesn't matter what I do because I'm going to heaven anyway or I'm going to hell anyway. Now, let's, let's talk about the, pre the preliminaries. Uh, in, in this particular, I call this 
primary or preliminary observation. There are two groups that I want to mention uh, as we when we're addressing this thing of predestination. Obviously, we've already touched on the first one, and this is where we started to get into the five points of Calvinism. There's Calvinist and or hyper Calvinism, okay? Presbyterians and congregational groups and reformed churches, you'll find many of what's called hyper Calvinists in those churches. Uh, these groups overemphasize the sovereignty of God. Uh, they refer to themselves as I've already said, sovereign grace. And you'll find some churches, Sovereign Grace Baptist Church, Sovereign Grace, uh, a Christian church. Okay, you'll see these titles. Okay, that's code for saying we believe in the sovereignty of God. We believe in all the tenets of Calvinism. Uh, their doctrine is divide, or derived, as I said earlier, from Calvin, John Calvin, and John Knox. Uh, John Calvin is considered to be, as I stated earlier, one of the fathers of the Reformation, which was good to break away from Calvinism or break away from the Catholic Church. Now, uh, the main scriptural references used uh, to endorse the teaching of Calvinism is found, as we saw earlier in Romans, I mentioned earlier, Romans chapter number eight. Uh, Calvinists call foreknowledge, election, and predestination the trinity of grace. The trinity of grace. Okay, you know, uh, predestined, foreknew, and uh, uh, election, the trinity of grace. Uh, when referring to the core beliefs, there are five a five-point acronym concerning the teaching of Calvinism or hyper-Calvinism. Uh, years ago, I wrote these down, and I uh, and and it's the, the the five points. You can spell it out. It's called tulip. Just like the tulip plant that you you, you pull up, it, that's T U L I P, T U L I P. Those are acronyms for Calvinism, hyper Calvinism. And what we want to look at now, as we get into these five points, we want to look at first of all T, okay? Which remember T U L I P. We want to look at T. Now, what does T represent in hyper in, in Calvinistic teaching? T represents what's called total depravity. Depravity, rather, total depravity. Now, total depravity, what is that? This teaches that uh, a man, this total depravity uh, uh, teaches uh, that man has his a total inability, total inability to do anything concerning this matter of salvation. We, you are, we are totally deprived of having any, any way of doing anything concerning this thing of salvation. Now, while it is true, we are totally deprived in our nature, okay? The Bible says there is no good thing that dwelleth in us. Okay, all of us are, all of our righteousness are as filthy rags in God's sight. Now, the educator, the college professor, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the engineer, they have problems with that, okay? Because they say, look at what I've accomplished. Look at what I've done for society and for the betterment of mankind. You mean to tell me everything I've accomplished in God's eyes is as filthy rags? Yes. Amen. Yes. And that individual will find out that's true when they die. Because here's the, here's the catcher. When we die, we cannot take, and, and I'm for, I, I don't want to criticize. I don't, I don't want to sound critical of education. Uh, I thank God for education. I was listening to a program earlier. And Mrs. McMillan criticizes some of my sermons when I preach. She'll criticize because I'll throw words in there that doesn't exist, you know. And, and I was listening to a preacher earlier this morning, and, and he made a statement. Oh, man, I, I can't remember it now. Uh, it, was, it was something, oh, if I remember it, I'll let you know. But, 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 uh, but when we die, we can take nothing with us. We can't take our college degrees. We can't take our money in our bank account. We can't take our clothes. We can take nothing with us. 
That's where the line is drawn when we think in terms of, of, of you know, of depravity and, and how we are in our natural state. Now, while the Bible, again, does teach that man is totally deprived in nature, uh, you know, I question that it teaches total inability, total inability. Total inability says this. There is nothing that we can do to respond to the gospel message. Nothing you can do to respond to the gospel message. When a preacher gives the invitation and you're sitting out in your pew, total inability says you might as well just sit there and do nothing because you cannot respond to that message, to that invitation. I believe that you can respond to that message. That's what I did. When I heard a preacher preach a sermon on how I was a sinner, how that I've broken God's commandments, I lied, I cussed, I cheated. And by the way, you did it too. Okay, you did it too. Well, preacher, I've never told a lie. Can I ask you how many of you in here will be honest before Almighty God raise your hand if you've ever told a lie? Okay, all right. Now, don't raise your hand because you're under pressure. Okay, don't. The preacher asked that question. I don't I, I guess I better raise my hand. I don't want to be the eyeball. But but no, in your heart, you you know, we, we disobeyed our parents. We lied to our parents. And, and, and those things. And, and, and so we understand our condition uh, as sinners without the Lord. But total inability says there's absolutely nothing we can do uh, to respond to the gospel message. I'm often reminded of the song, there is a fount which, uh, that's filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilt and stain. You know, that, that reminds me of the goodness of God and, and how God has, he wants us to be saved. He, he sent his son. Now, let me give you a reference here. In John chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, the Bible says this. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. We know that's John the Baptist. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. Now the catcher to verse number two is this. He said that all men through him might believe. All men through the preaching of, of John the Baptist during that day, God wanted all of them to believe. He wanted all of them to be saved. And we understand that that same message that resonated with the people in John's day is the same message that we preach today. And that is, behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, yes, we are all born totally depraved, okay? But the Lord Jesus Christ gives enough light to every person who makes his responsive makes it his or her responsibility to hear the message and to respond to what they heard they can either receive the message of the gospel or they can reject it it's up to them john chapter 5 verse 40 says this and ye will not come to me that ye might have life Jesus, when he made that statement, he was talking to the religious crowd, to the people of his day. He said, you won't come to me, not because God said that you can't come to me, not because God has elected you not to come to me, but you won't come to me because, or you won't come to me that, that you might have life. You made a choice not to come to me. And so, so this is the first one here. Total depravity or total depravity. Uh, it says that, that we can do nothing in the area uh, of, of responding to the gospel message. That's what Calvinists believe. And I'm here to tell you that's wrong. I had to do something. I had to say, Jesus, uh, Lord Jesus, remember me when thou enter into thy kingdom. And he said, today shall thou be with me in paradise. Now, now, he could have said, could have just stayed there on the cross and did nothing. Like the Calvinists would say, well, one is predestined to go to heaven and one is predestined. No, he had to respond. He had to respond. All right, we're going to leave off right there.
Uh, we're going to pick this up next week as we look more into the teaching of Calvinism. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for this lesson. Uh, God, help us to, uh, to be better defenders of the faith, uh, Lord, as we seek uh, to be able to better explain our position on Calvinism as we encounter some people that uh, have embraced this. We ask your blessings on the service this morning. I pray, God, that you would touch the hearts of those who decided to, to come out today. And, Lord, we know, God, that you love us. You sent your son to die for us. God, thank you that we can respond to that same message. In Jesus' precious name, we ask these things.